Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome editor of the book collector, Mr. Nicholas Parker. Well, this is a, a remarkable occasion for me on two counts. Three, actually. It's the first time I've been to Singapore for 40 years. In 1974, it was a very different place from what I've already seen. Secondly, it's the first time that I have ever given a lecture at nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And I'm deeply touched to see so many of you who have risen at this uh, unusual hour. And thirdly, I just wanted to say that I have, as the book collector of which I've been editor, or if I'm spared, will have been editor for 50 years next year, I thought you probably won't have seen it. So I've brought, and I'm going to pass around, an old copy of the journal and also a little leaflet which tells you a bit more about it. And if you'd like, don't hang on to it too long <laughs> because there are quite a lot of you. Well, my story begins <clears throat> in the spring of 1929 when Ian Fleming, not quite 21, James Bond, not even a twinkle in his eye, was walking down Bond Street and saw a sign in the famous bookseller Dulo's window. It read, The New D. H. Lawrence. It was not Lady Chatterley's Lover, which had been published the previous year, but his little book of poetry called Pansies. Drawn in, however, because Lawrence was very much in the news at the time, he met Percy Muir. And then and there began a friendship that lasted for 35 years. Percy was self-educated. He had come from a very poor background, had become an actor, decided that the stage was no life for him, and passionately involved in books, uh, was already a successful bookseller. Ian, at the time, was studying at Geneva for a place in the Foreign Office. They spent that day talking about books to read, books as an investment, and collecting as an occupation, discovering as they talked a common dislike of convention and a habit of questioning its assumptions. This lasted after Percy moved to Elkin Matthews, a famous old booksellers uh, who went back to uh, Wilde in the 90s. And Ian had not become a member of the Foreign Office, but a stockbroker. As a stockbroker, he made an unexpected windfall of 250 pounds. Well, you probably don't need telling uh, that that is a very small sum today, but in 1929, on the brink of the Depression, it was a vast sum. It was a godsend to uh, Elkin Matthews, who were practically bankrupt at the time. He had an idea with what he was going to invest the money in. Percy was to find milestone books, as he called them, the first book on zip fasteners, the first book on golf, the first book on bicycles, motor cars, aeroplanes. There was no scope, to be no limit to the scope of the idea, except that nothing published before the year 1800 would qualify. This, I think, was simply to give definition to the concept of an invention. Before that, it was too difficult. Well, Elkin Matthews had in stock an excellent copy of Darwin's The Origin on the Origin of Species in 1859. It cost 10 pounds. Nowadays, I think it costs 100,000 pounds. This was a very good beginning, but it took a lot of hard work to identify, let alone find copies of other books that fitted. They were not dear 
Röntgen's 1895-6 paper on x-rays cost seven pounds, 10 shillings. Marie Curie's in 1903, isolating radium, a mere four pounds. Freud's epoch-making Die Traumdeutung, his theory of the psychological importance of dreams, 1899, was also four pounds. Both Ian and Percy were delighted that so much could be got for so little. And so the collection went on after the initial 250 pounds was spent. And per Ian became so far involved as to become a director of Elkin Matthews. World War II plunged him into naval intelligence and a lifelong fascination with secret service in all its forms. When the war was over, Lord Kemsley, who was then the biggest press baron in England, offered him the job of foreign manager of his newspapers, including the Sunday Times, which had a huge circulation in those days. And he, he is responsible for inventing what were then not called features, uh, the, a, a particular issue or article on an individual topic. In 1950, he moved to a new flat, the top floor of 24 Carlisle Mansions, Cheney Walk, not far from where Thomas Carlisle lived, and hence the name of the uh, apartment block. Uh, and in the same block, John Hayward shared his flat with T.S. Eliot. John Hayward lived with T.S. Eliot for about seven years, and he's largely thought to be responsible for quite a bit of the four quartets. Books had rather dropped out of Fleming's life during the war. He had too much to do point, uh, planning commando actions and that sort of thing. And the milestones, the books that he'd already collected, <coughs> were living in black fitted boxes and immured in a storage company outside London. They now returned from an unexpected direction. Lord Kemsley had been encouraged to start his own venture in the book trade. And the Dropmore Press was set up in 1945 at 9 Great James Street, Hoburn. The Dropmore Press was the last of the great British private presses. William Morris had started the movement with the Kelmscott Press. Uh, Cobden Sanderson had founded the Doves Press. St. John Hornby, the Ashendine Press, all books printed beautifully by letterpress printing on handmade paper and beautifully bound. And Lord Kemsley's Dropmore Press, which flourished, as you gather, for a very short length of time, maintained the same standards and also, as they had, gave employment to wood engravers. In 1950, a second string to this enterprise was added. In 1947, Reginald Horrocks, a bookseller, had founded the Book Handbook, which, <clears throat> against all the adverse conditions of post-war publishing, no paper, no power, everything in short supply, despite all these adverse conditions, it had so far achieved nine numbers. Horrocks was very hard up, and so the printing was transferred to the Dropmore Press, and the distribution of the book handbook became part of the business of the Queen Anne Press, a ordinary commercial printing firm plus publishing business which Lord Kemsley set up at the same address as the Dropmore Press in Great James Street. Eight more numbers appeared in 1950 and 1951, but in 1952 the journal appeared in new guise as The Book Collector Incorporating Book Handbook with a new editorial board of Ian Fleming, John Hayward, and Percy Muir. An announcement in the journal recorded this, drawing attention to new features, the regular series on bindings, book bindings and autographs, and the very useful series of bibliographical notes and queries, which anybody could submit. Next year, the size went up from small octavo to large. The imprint changed from the Dropmore to the Queen Anne Press, <clears throat> and Christopher Dobson took over as editor. As the first number of the book collector appeared, Ian was at Goldeneye in Jamaica, the house that he'd bought as a getaway after the war, 
Typing the last words of his first novel, Casino Royale, what was he to do with it? <clears throat> On the 12th of May, 1952, having lunch with his old friend, William Plumer, the poet, he said, William, how do you get, how do you get cigarette smoke out of a woman once you've got it in? <laughs> After a moment's bewilderment, Plumer explained, you've written a book. And ignoring Ian's protests, he got the typescript out of him and showed it to his fellow reader, editor, at Jonathan Cape, Daniel George. <clears throat> they persuaded a rather reluctant Cape that this was a publishable book, and terms, rather less than Ian had hoped, were agreed in September. Casino Royale was published on the 13th of April, 1953, at 10 shillings and sixpence, and was well reviewed, notably by John Betjeman and by Raymond Chandler, who became the first subject in the Uncollected Authors series in The Book Collector that autumn. Home on leave from the army for the coronation, which took place that year, it was the 61st anniversary the day before yesterday, uh, I was quick to buy a copy of what was already the second impression before publication. The jacket was of the first impression, overprinted with an extract from the review in the Sunday Times under the name of Christopher Pym, in inverted commas, he was really the f celebrated critic Cyril Ray, which ended with the words, here is the best new thriller writer since Eric Ambler. And at this point, uh, Ian Fleming and James Bond had set off together to a future which all of you will know. Bond went from strength to strength, multiplied by pan paperbacks, which took it even further afield, and the gigantic success of the Salzman Broccoli films, as you doubtless know, are completely insuppressible. In, in, in the recent bibliography of Ian Fleming, which has come out, is actually as thick as who's who, and it, all it does is record all the different impressions of James Bond novels. Anyway, all this lay in the future in 1955 when, as suddenly as he had begun, Lord Kemsley withdrew from the press, from fine printing and publishing. Half captivated and half frightened by Ian Fleming, he threatened to close the book collector. Ian protested to him that the journal would bring much credit to your name among the scholars and librarians of the world but to no avail. Instead, he offered to take the journal off Lord Kinsley's hand and paid for it with a pound note over lunch. Printing and distribution was transferred to the Shenville Press, but it was Hayward and Muir who ensured the future of the book collector by writing to a, prominent, a number of prominent book collectors in England and America, who between them provided a sum of two, over 2,000 pounds. This hedge against whatever the future might bring, John Hayward's running away money, Ian called it. You may remember, those of you who've read um, Love in a Cold Climate, that the heroine was always trying to amass little sums as her running away money. Anyway, it was John Hayward's running away money uh, encouraged him to continue with the journal. To consolidate matters in September, uh, 1952, he formed a company called The Collector Limited with a nominal capital of £100 and £101 shares. Hayward and Muir each took one share and Fleming the remaining 98. Despite the pressure of growing literary fame, <clears throat> Ian was not unmindful of the book collector, but mostly he left it to John Hayward. Chair-bound with muscular dystrophy, he couldn't move and became increasingly crippled but increasingly sharp and dominant in conversation. People who went to visit him, went to visit him because they were terrified of what he would say if they didn't. Leaving after an interview with him, they were even more terrified of, of what he would say behind them, about, about them behind his ba their backs. And this became John Hayward's main occupation. But when Elliot left him in January 1957, Ian was quick to call with cheering gossip. 
He read and criticized the journal, but he never forgot his obligation to keep the book collector under the editorship of John alive and for no other purpose whatsoever. He enjoyed the first article I wrote in 1958 and told me so. There was much more to divert him. David, article, David Foxon's articles on libertine literature in 17th century England broke new ground. Others had to be smuggled in from behind the Iron Curtain, like that on the Matenadaran Library at Erivan in Georgia. The articles on great collectors, past and present, lists of all the books removed from the great houses of Chatsworth and Holcomb to meet the then punitive rate of death duties. But above all, and most important, there were Hayward's incisive introductory commentaries. It was Hayward who got to hear of the imprisonment by, in Franco's prisons of uh, the Italian bookseller in Spain, Salvatore Ferraioli, and wrote an article in the book collector which Ian saw was circulated in the Sunday Times, pointing out that it was not Ferraioli, but one of the canons of the cathedral who had stolen the books. And this ensured Ferraioli's escape. So it was a journal with some power, as well as a great variety of contents. Now, not quite, well, 10 years later, in July 1963, the Printing and the Mind of Man exhibition at Earl's Court introduced the Fleming book collection to a wider public. And although more books came from Maynard Keynes's collection left to King's College, Cambridge, Fleming's books attracted more attention from the press. Visitors were startled to discover this unexpected attribute in the, in the inventor of 007. The exhibition only lasted for a fortnight but its impact then and since has been considerable. And looking back, we can see the revolutionary effect of PMM, as it came to be known, not only in connecting intellectual development with the means by which it was transmitted, but also on the scope of the contemporary book trade over five centuries. If considerable effort was made to identify the movements and developments that seemed to derive from the publication of a particular book, it was obvious that most movements are gradual. The result not of one book, but several publications. What seemed with hindsight to be important was often neglected or misunderstood at the time, while what was hailed as important by its contemporaries seemed now to be of mainly antiquarian interest. Contemporary importance, however, was real enough to the book trade. And the contrast between contemporary evaluation and that of posterity was a paradox that needed proper consideration by the little group charged with selection. It couldn't be brushed aside as a quirk of intellectual fashion, nor yet as the background to what now seemed significant. The, the truth of the matter is that uh, despite its pretext of absolute intellectual coverage, printing in the mind of man was as much the creature of its time, a reflection of what seemed then as any other view of the uh, history of ideas. That view, the view represented by PMM, came from one source, the mind of Stanley Morrison. It was to be his last great undertaking, the last that he saw finished and executed. Since his conversion to typography and its history in 1912, he'd come to have a unique authority in the world of print and letter forms, his ideas and work both informed by a strong sense of history. In 1925, he became, within a few months, <coughs> typographical advisor to both the Monotype Corporation and the Cambridge University Press. Monotype had reached its technical zenith, ideally placed to execute the type designs based on historic mo models that Morrison conceived. As used by the Cambridge University Press under his eye, the books set a new standard for good design that achieved international fame for both institutions. Morrison's editorship of the Fleuron and other books established his reputation as a historian as well as a designer of type and his trenchantly expressed opinions, prefaced with, according to me, 
became proverbial, nor were they restricted to typography. In 1907, he had found refuge from spiritual void in the Catholic Church. His faith remained strong, but never uncritical. Asked by Tom Barnes of Burns and Oates, the Catholic publishers, how he reconciled his faith with current orthodoxy, he was blunt. I wouldn't belong to this bunch of macaroni merchants for another second if it wasn't the way of laying hold on Christ. His political views were equally clear-cut. A conscientious objector in World War I, he was too independent-minded for the Communist Party with whom his sympathies lay. The same sense of history that he brought to typography informed both his faith and his political views. And he found a like-minded friend and coadjutor in Eric Gill. Together, they created the types based on Gill's designs, Perpetua and Gill Sands. The Catholic faith that they shared did not prevent them from criticizing its earthly representatives. The Spanish Civil War found them united in hope for the Republican cause, sorrow at its failure, and horror of the fascism whose evils they saw all too clearly. Besides Monotype and Cambridge, Morrison had a third attachment as advisor to the Times newspaper, to which he had given a new type and new overall design in 1932. His allegiance to this bastion of conservative respectability was a further paradox in his personality. He wrote The History of English Newspapers in 1933, a book which still is the only thorough survey of the subject. And he became fascinated in the process by the links between the design and the editorial policy of newspapers. As a result, he began to write the history of the Times itself. Her work that continued after World War II and during the war, all his papers and most of his books were destroyed by enemy action. This was a severe setback to his two long-term projects, the history of the ancient fell types at the Oxford University Press and the study, study of Greco-Roman letter forms over the last 2,000 years. But the history of the times was finished in 1955 and despite failing sight, he was ready to take on a new challenge. His friend Jack Matson, chairman of the Monotype Corporation, was in 1963 to be president of the Association of British Manufacturers of Printing Machinery, responsible for IPEX, the annual international exhibition of printing machinery. Morrison suggested to him the idea of a historic exhibition to go with it. There were to be two parts, one recording the growth and development of printing itself and its technology, the other its principal products. From the outset, Morrison's interest concentrated on the latter, which came rather confusingly to be called the historical as opposed to the technical part. I say it's confusing because they were, of course, both historical. <coughs> Morrison had spent most of the preceding 50 years thinking about printing and what made it great. And in the process, he had gathered round him, rather like Dr. Johnson, a group of friends who admired the vigor of his mind and the force with which he expressed it. He summoned them to the new task. First of these friends was John Carter, whose intelligence and style, if different from his own, he much admired. Carter had for many years been the head of the London branch of Scribner's, the New York booksellers, and he was now fulfilling the same role at Sotheby's, the auctioneers in London. Equally important was Percy Muir, busy since the war re-establishing the shattered links of the Euro European book trade. He was responsible for the founding of the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers and became its first chairman, president. Besides these two were Howard Nixon, Henry Steinberg, Helmut Feisenberger, and myself. 
Nixon represented the British Museum, whom Morrison had rightly identified as a sine qua non for an exhibition of printing of all periods. Steinberg was the editor of the Statesman's Yearbook and the author of a very influential Penguin book, 500 Years of Printing. Weisenberger, like him, another refugee, was now Sotheby's chief cataloguer of printed books. And I was very much the junior member of the group, engaged by Morrison in 1958 as editor to help him finish his outstanding work. I owed this indirectly to Senator William Benton, uh, a multimillionaire publisher and uh, political figure in the US of A, who was one of many who had come to admire Morrison's forceful intellect. He'd asked him to become principal advisor on a new edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which he owned, to combat a new Russian encyclopedia intended to infiltrate the countries of the Third World. I was the price that Morrison extracted for this, which took him to Chicago, which he enjoyed, if at considerable detriment to his health. Muir was our chairman. He had far more experience of the task than the rest of us. Years spent discussing with Fleming what should or should not be included in his collection had made the dialectic involved a familiar exercise. He made it enjoyable for the rest of us. The task, as he defined it, was formidable, and this is what he wrote. It meant, first, constructing a canon of eligible material, pinpointing the key books in the entire range of Western thought and discovery. No mean job in itself. Secondly, the significance of each entry would have to be indicated within a maximum of 80 to 100 words. Thirdly, when the entries had been chosen, copies of the books themselves had to be found in locations, libraries, where they could, whence they could be borrowed. And fourthly, a team had to be recruited, able and willing to cooperate in all these different phases of the undertaking. We were limited by the fact that literature, music and the arts were to be omitted unless they contributed to the mind of man, unless they were intellectual monuments. Only those were included that led to the propagation of ideas. This included Candide and Alice in Wonderland, ideas or characters like Hamlet or Faust, which had or could be demonstrated to have sensibly affected the thinking and as well as actions of men. Another limitation was the absence of books, notably Oriental, that were not printed from metal type. Both omissions were criticized at the time but any expansion beyond the limits I've described would have blurred the outline of Morrison's co concept without adding any defensible proportion of either element. The first list of possibles was drawn up quickly and as quickly cut to pieces and redrawn, and that process happened several times. Our presumed expertise Nixon on theology, Muir on education and the human sciences, Feisenberger, geography, exploration and all the other sciences, Steinberg, history and politics, mind, philosophy and the classics, with Carter contributing a few seminal texts. These uh, divisions had begun to merge in the theme of the exhibition as a whole. One of us might propose and draft an entry, another rewrite it. Sixteen successive lists were duplicated and circulated. A rearrangement of our list by subject, uh, instead of alphabetically, revealed several glaring omissions. The restriction of literature, music and the arts, at first painful, came to seem a blessing as our task came to be more one of exclusion than inclusion. Then came the hardest task of all, finding copies of the books. Although choice was never determined by availability, 
We were afraid, wrongly as it proved, that great libraries would not lend their treasures. We tried to get evocative copies wherever possible. Henry VIII's Assertio Septem Sacramentorum of 1521 was the copy from the Royal Library at Windsor. The first Encyclopedia Britannica, the first Baedeker Guide, and the first Brockhaus Dictionary were the publisher's own file copies. The most copious single lender was, as I said, King's College, Cambridge, which had been uh, 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 bequeathed the wonderful collection of Maynard Keynes after his tragically early death in 1946. 51 books came from the Keynes collection, followed by 44 from the Fleming collection. Special climate-controlled cases were built to fit the books, all in chronological order, a rare, if not unique, instance. Anybody who has tried to fit an exhibition of books into pre-existing cases will know the irritating fact that they never, never fit in chronological order. So we were very lucky to have the cases built to fit the books, not the other way around. When the day for setting up came, the books which had been brought together in the British Museum were packed into an armoured van and the van driven straight into the lift at the exhibition floor on at, at Earl's Court, whence they were taken to specially, the specially made cases. And the process was reversed when the exhibition closed. Not a book was damaged, still less lost at any point. The exhibition only lasted for 10 days, from 16 to 27 July 1963. But the response was dramatic, not only from a large public and the national press, unused to trade fairs, they weren't used to going and visiting what were regarded as simply an affair for those involved in the trade, and it got copiously reviewed in the general press. But even more important for, for us, apprentices and students from printing schools from all over the country came and increasingly, the technical staff on the stands in the technical exhibition used to steal away from their job and look at this rival attraction. But this was not the end. It didn't come to an end in July 1963. More was about to follow. An expanded version of the catalogue in folio had been foreseen from the outset. And four years later, it appeared in 1967 both editions, the small exhibition catalogue and the large folio, a tribute to the design skills of John Dreyfus and Reynolds Stone, who engraved the beautiful panels on the title pages. This is not the place to pursue the long subsequent history of PMM, the German and Japanese editions, the proposals to augment the original selection or create sectional versions, rightly rejected in my view, Still less the endless parodies of the title. I, only the other day I saw an exhibition called Printing and the Brain of Man. It lends itself to parodies of that sort. But all these manifestations are, in their different ways, tributes to the vitality of Morrison's original concept. What we didn't know when we started on this was how difficult it would be to write 80 to 100 words in which to sum up the thought of Plato and Aristotle presents its hazards. But to be given 500 to 1,000 words, as we learnt to our cost, merely doesn't give you much be better chance of explaining who Plato and Aristotle were, but it gives you about 10 times the chance of falling flat on your face in public. We had guessed correctly that PMM, like the Grolier 100, that was another famous collection at an exhibition in New York in 1900, which was uh, the great works of literature. We guessed that PMM would be added to the book trade's pantheon of re useful references. We did not guess how much it would influence both private and institutional collecting, nor the extent to which it would increase the price of the books that we selected those, at least, that were accessible, which not all were. 
No one has, so far as I know, attempted to recreate another set of PMM. Impossible, I would say, if I had not seen other feats deemed impossible achieved. For both John Carter and Percy Muir, it was the summit of their professional lives. And its existence on the shelves of most libraries is a monument to their work. Now, despite constant pressure, Ian Fleming never wrote a word for the book collector. And its affairs, like his own, were surprised by his sudden death on the 12th of August, 1964. Then and after his death, John Hayward remain, maintained an iron grip on the authors, printers, subscribers, and advertisers. Any backsliding by any of them was rebuked in excoriating words which made his rarer praise the more appreciated. He died just over a year after Fleming on 17 September 1965, and it was at his memorial service at St. Luke's Chelsea on the 1st of October that I became his successor, gently coerced by Muir, Carter and other friends. So the book collector set off again, now without John Hayward's running away money, meant to be a shield against em em emergency, but now all absorbed by the punitive tax on the Fleming estate. Fleming had become limitlessly rich on the royalties of the bond books, and 98% of his money disappeared to the Inland Revenue. Well now, it's all but 50 years on, and we are in a world of old books, not greatly changed, apart from the prices paid for what are now called iconic authors' books. Ian Fleming's books have become iconic. Iconic is a word that has recently acquired a new meaning in the Oxford English Dictionary. The original definition was belonging to an image. It's now blurred uneasily into designating a person or thing regarded as representative of a culture or movement. A rather uneasy, weaselly definition which I think it must be regarded as work in progress for the lexicographers. In book trade terms, iconic, like rare or fine, just means expensive. <laughs> Descartes' Discours de la Méthode and Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, both of them in Printing in the Mind of Man, are iconic. So are Pride and Prejudice and Wuthering Heights, which are not. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Waverley, Disraeli's Sibyls, all in PMM, are not iconic. Candide and Alice both are. The Rights of Man, 1791, is iconic, all right. But Burke's once famous Reflections on the Revolution in France, 1790, which is firmly in PMM, is, is definitely not iconic. In 1963, we wondered whether posterity would reverse our verdicts or at least see not one but conflicting views as equally significant. We couldn't have guessed then that iconic would come to take the place of what we thought of as significant. I'm not sure that this is a good thing. But other changes, alarming though they have seemed to some, strike me as less so. The worst is the disappearance of bookshops from high streets. While the universal pressure of increased property values has made it seem inevitable, a determined bookseller and a sympathetic landlord like the Salisbury family at Cecil Court in London shows that it need not be. Cecil Court is solid bookshops from end to end. But it had beneficial changes, this. Relieved of shop hours, booksellers became, have become more mobile and imaginative. They get about, visit each other's shops, and that was a practice which was severely frowned on 50 years ago. Booksellers didn't let other booksellers in their shops. They might find out what books they'd got and what prices they'd put on them. 
Booksellers have discovered new reasons for buying and selling and even reading books. The internet and the thousands of books offered for sale on ABE, Via Libri and other sites which offer incalculable numbers of books for sale have put these books in the reach of booksellers and book collectors who do not have to leave their desks to acquire them. This has meant that many books once thought to be rare have become common and that's no bad thing but it deprives us all of the pleasure of looking for actual as opposed to virtual books on the shelves of libraries as well as bookshops. It also takes away the magic chance of discovering not the book that you were looking for but a different, unknown and ultimately more interesting and exciting book which happens to be next to it on the shelf. Doubtless virtual shelves will make this possible one day. I refuse to be alarmed about the risk that e-books will banish real books. There's room for both and no sign that one will banish the other. I was talking to the chairman of Pearson Longman who owned a string of pub publishing firms and he said, well, I give what he called the 699 paperback, that's to say the bottom end of the paperback range, uh, five years before the Kindle overtakes it and makes it uh, unvi uh, unviable. But he said there's no sign that serious books are in any danger whatsoever. People like to have a solid book in their hands if they are reading about it. And what is more, it's not a price sensitive market. Uh, they're as willing to pay £18 as £15, I can't do that in dollars, for uh, a book which they like. So I, don't th I think that we will see books printed on paper and bound in boards going on for longer than the prophets of doom say. But one wholly beneficial result of the electronic revolution is that more and more people are beginning to take the secondary aspects of books, their physical characteristics, the signs of their movements in time, of their owners and their binders, much more seriously. These are characteristics which book catalogues call copy specific, by which they mean they're unique to the book, the individual book in, in their hands. And it is very interesting how more and more people who buy books are becoming attuned to the fact that this is not just something to read, but carries with it a mirror of the times in which it was printed, or the many, many years perhaps through which it has continued to exist in time. All these uh, are just as useful and interesting as the primary role of books as bearers of texts for reading. So I think that the book as an object, as a piece of the furniture of our everyday lives, will survive. And it's these changes of taste that enliven the book collector's pages to this day. Those of you who've had a time to glance at the copy that I've circulated will be able to see what it is. What does not change is the common passion for books shared by its readers and contributors, uh, along, um, among which I hope some of you will be. There, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and if anybody has any questions or brickbats to throw at me, <laughs> now is the time to do so. Yes, sir? I, sh I should say I once gave a lecture in Japan at the end of which there were no questions whatsoever. I teased them, I insulted them, <laughs> I charmed them, I did my best to get them to talk to me. And uh, one of them who realized that what I was trying to, to do was to you know, induce a little togetherness, said, you've got to understand that Japan is a very different place. He said, when I was a student, I was once interested by a lecture and I went up to the lecture at the lecturer and said, ask my question. He didn't even look at me. He said, he went on walking and said, young man, the university library will answer any questions you have. <laughs> Mr. Barker, I do have a question and I have to ask a question yeah, to, to defend Singapore's honor. <laughs> and it shall be asked with no teasing required. I am very curious. Uh, there are some 
budding book collectors here amongst uh, good I presume the mainly librarian crowd here and one thing I'm very interested in is the emergence of the new generation of book collectors what are they like I'm curious and are there any or is John the final book collector I know <laughs> so no, I'm really curious about that no, John, 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 John is, can't be contained within the definition of book collector he's a potentate of enormous uh, range um, well, the great thing about that, I mean, when I, when, I was, when I was young, you know, 50 years ago, all the, not only the book collectors, but the booksellers were all crying into their beer uh, and saying that they were the last of their kind. Uh, they would, um, their sons had gone into computers or management consultancy and uh, books, no, no, no. Uh, the last old book had already been bought. I collect instances of people saying that there are no more books left to collect. My earliest example is 1717. And if anybody can find an earlier instance of people saying there are no more books to collect. So you don't have to worry about the book collectors. Book collecting can be done on a very limited budget. All it needs is to have a little determination and an idea. If you have an idea, you can do it with paperbacks. And I've known some very interesting collections made uh, entirely of paperbacks. And of course, uh, comics now fetch huge sums of important or early editions of comics. So uh, th th they're quite young. They're not very rich. Uh, all they want is uh, to have something physical that they can touch. This is very fascinating. Just last week we met a map collector ah. and the map collector said the same thing. Yes. He said you don't have to be rich to be a map collector because maps don't cost as much as art. And I presume no, books don't cost as much as Absolutely, of course. No, ma well, um, <laughs> well, no, I mean, people can pay huge prices for maps. It depends on the map. But I mean, it's perfectly true that, you know, I mean, people pay hundreds of thousands for 15th or 16th century maps of some of them of great beauty. But you see, even a late 19th century school atlas can be an interesting document because it's a picture of the political boundaries of the time, who, what, who belonged to what, what the products were. There are all sorts of interesting information from books which you can still pick up for you know, very insignificant sums. Oh, he's got, we've got a question. Be brave. <laughs> Thanks for this morning talk. I'd just like to ask you a question. Have you read your first e-book already? And if you have, uh, what's your impression? And would you continue to read e-books? Um, yes, I have. I have. I've, I actually, the British Library uh, um, maintains a very useful little room where you can just walk in off the street, I think. I don't think you have to be a reader and try out the latest reading machine. And you have to remember that Kindle, although it's much, much touted by Amazon and so forth, is by no means the only and not even the best e-reader. There are, there are uh, Sony do a particularly good one. Um, and I don't mind them. I mean, <laughs> the, they make me laugh because uh, the, the Kindle, uh, the, the, the significant breakthrough, because you know, the original, almost all the original e-books were gre green letters, of dark green letters of particularly hideous outline printed on pale green background and they were really actually quite painful to read. They got better and what made me laugh was that the scientists at MIT in, in Harvard uh, uh, have spent untold millions trying to simulate the slightly off-white creamy texture of paper and uh, so as to give more, you know, what you need, more contrast, trust of black and white, and that nice off-white that is kind to the eye, you know, dead white, uh, is very, very painful to, to, to read. And <laughs> this ridiculous thing is that having patented this, which is, as I say, taken millions to do it, did they call it paper? No, they called it ink. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, you know, it doesn't bother me. I can, I, I can read them, and I can quite see that, that, that uh, you know, if you're going away on a holiday, uh, if, you, if you've got a Kindle with you, you can take 600,000 books, uh, so to speak. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's another one. Good. Excellent. No, no, don't be silly. 
Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, I, I found it very interesting to, for you when you mentioned about, you know, the book as an object. I come from a museum background, uh -huh. and uh, often um, you meet um, people all in the library business um, who look at books as information. Yes. But I often see book as information plus, you know, the object itself. So I'm wondering, for all the book collectors uh, today, are they just looking at the books as um, objects or, or, or more about the information within the object? Yeah. Well, uh, 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 you put your finger on it, really. They're looking for both. I mean, obviously, um, you, uh, uh, a book is primarily for reading. But by taking a book, whether it's a new book or a book that's 30 years old or a book that's 100 years old, the mere act of reading it in that form, you absorb whether you uh, consciously do it or not, some of the period in which it was written and the audience for which it was written for. So to take a very obvious example, the first edition of Pride and Prejudice, which is a very expensive book, uh, printed in 1813, you do get a special feeling of who Jane Austen was and who her original readers were, which adds very sensibly to your own enjoyment if you can do it. So that uh, if you come from a museum background, you've got a double uh, or treble layer here because what you're reading about is archaeological objects or uh, art works which have their existence. You're reading about them. The way you read about them brings them, brings them to life or brings a new element to just staring at them yourself. And then there's the third element that you're actually looking at them with the eyes of the people for whom the book you were written. You see, take a, 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 a work of art history written in 1880. Lots of it will strike you as wrong, the colours will be defective or something or other, but it gives you an idea of what people felt about it when they saw it. I have a follow-up question to yes. what this lady have just uh, asked. I have, I have a problem because over the years, I've, uh, I've loved books and, you know, if I go to another country, I'll buy one or two books, you know, and yes. it continues to accumulate. And most of them, I really don't read it, you know, or like, <laughs> or like half finished. So how, how do you solve it for me? Uh, it's, it's very heartbreaking for me to throw away the book. Well, uh, it's also very heartbreaking <laughs> for, for people who say that, you know, just tear away the pages that you want, you know. Now, look, there's, uh, a, there's a very, very, very <laughs> easy... Uh, the, the basic answer to this is very, very simple. People come into your house and they say, probably they say, you haven't read all these books, have you? <laughs> and you say, no, but they're there when I want to. <laughs> and the, 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 uh, I mean, there's a classic case of a, a, a famous bookbinder who was very good at binding books. He bound a book for a very great book collector called Henry Drury, this is Francis Bedford. And uh, Henry Drury found that it was, uh, uh, as far as he was concerned, beautiful though the binding was, um, it was unfit for purpose. He went back to Mr. Bed Mr. Bedford, he said, I can hardly read the inside of the book. It won't open properly. And Bedford looked at him and said, you haven't been reading it, sir. <laughs> Bookbinders have entirely different views of what books are for, you see. <laughs> but don't worry, don't worry. I mean, and the books will accumulate and th there'll, be a, there'll be a reason for them. You'll find it out one day. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. We have to close. Um, thank you guys for coming down and rescue. Um, yes. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>